Hi, my name is Karen Fannin. I'm currently a professor of conducting and director of the School of Music at the University of Nebraska at Omaha. It's my pleasure to introduce Alan McMurray to you, who's a past president of CBDNA and also my teacher. Alan retired in 2013 after spending 35 years as director of bands at the University of Colorado, and he's still very active as a guest conductor. So those of us who are fortunate to get to spend extended time with Alan and study with him um, really appreciate that time. And many of you probably attended the CBDNA conducting symposium and had a chance to work with him as well. So we'll talk more about that during this interview. Alan has been honored uh, by CU Boulder with a lifetime appointment as a distinguished professor. And this past spring, he was awarded the University Medal by the CU Board of Regents. And in 2019, Alan was honored with the Lifetime Achievement Award by CBDNA. So let's go ahead and get started with our conversation. Uh, so welcome, Alan. Um, could you tell us about your very first experience with CBDNA? Yeah, my first experience with CBDNA was actually as a performer in uh, the Long Beach State College Band conducted by Robert Reynolds and um, with a performance in Utah uh, for the National Convention. And uh, at that time, I remember, um, uh, the, because I was playing principal trumpet, I, I remember the program clearly because uh, there was so much chop busting stuff on it. Um, but we did uh, Lincoln Traposi, we did uh, uh, the Hindemith Concert Music for Blas Orchestra, Opus 41. Um, I think we did George Washington Bridge on the same program. Uh, we did a, um, a, a couple of marches. Um, had a great time. I was playing principal trumpet. Eugene Corcoran was playing principal clarinet in that group. Uh, so we both shared that first CBDNA experience. Uh, but I don't remember much about the conference because I didn't attend it. I don't remember uh, much about the people who attended it other than uh, uh, those people who I met afterwards. I did have one memorable experience uh, following the performance um, backstage. A band director came up to me and identified himself as William D. Rebelli and oh. said that if I was interested in doing graduate work, they had an opening at Michigan. So I thought, well, oh. I, but I didn't know who he was at that time. So sure. uh, later on, I was I, I shared that with uh, with Bob Reynolds and he said, oh, that's interesting. Yeah. <laughs> but that's my memory of my first CBDNA uh, conference. I was not a conductor. I was a performer. Sure. Yeah, that is interesting how memories work, too, because there are so many people in the current moment that we work with and we don't know what the future holds. And then much later, we can look back. And so that's that's really cool, you know, that you can look back and have those memories current and of the past of, of those people you played with. Yeah. And it's wonderful. The, the one thing that and we'll talk about this later, Karen, I think. But uh, the one thing that, that is meaningful to me is that um, my teacher and good friend Robert Reynolds and my good friend Eugene Corcoran all shared that with me. Yeah. Uh, so could you tell us about uh, your influences that inspired you to be a conductor? I don't think I ever really wanted to be a conductor. What I wanted to do was I wanted to be just a, a, the best musician I could be. And uh, trumpet was my instrument. And, um, and I loved playing and I loved collaborating and I loved playing in brass quintets. And I, and I typically was playing principal trumpet in brass quintets where I was having to study the, the music in advance and look, kind of lead the rehearsals in the brass quintets. And, but, but that energy of that and then uh, playing in the ensemble under Bob Reynolds inspired me to take conducting classes. Uh, and I took my first conducting class with Don Wilcox, then um, Bob Reynolds, uh, who had an advanced class that Eugene and I took with him. Uh, and then I studied choral conducting with Frank Fuller there. And not because I wanted to be a conductor, but just I felt that it was helping me understand music better, not only my part, but everybody else's part. And I was excited about that from a collaborative point of view. So it wasn't until... Um, years later, I, I did my graduate work at, at uh, Wisconsin, but not in conducting, was in trumpet performance. Got my first college teaching job, teaching trumpet and horn, and then uh, was in Europe um, uh, performing and auditioning and, and was given some opportunities there to uh, play in major symphonies or to uh, to do teaching. It was, it, was a, it was a good time in my life as a trumpet player, but I I, I was struck with the fact that if I did that, uh, there was a lot of great music that I would never have a chance to deal with. 
And so when I was in Europe, I called Bob Reynolds uh, and I said, I'm not sure that this is what I want to do. And he said, well, I'm starting a graduate program in conducting. If you're interested, you can come back. And when you put in residency on your doctorate in trumpet, which I'd already begun, um, you can get a second master's in conducting. That's when I shifted gears, was at that moment. Uh, and I'm trying to remember what year that was. It was in the um, 70s. Mm -hmm. I guess it was. Uh, and, uh, and I was in that first class with Bob Reynolds uh, and Stan Derusha was in that with me. Um, and we uh, began this journey of, of teaching. I was, I guess, the first graduate student in conducting that Bob had because uh, he had just started that program there and there was no graduate program at Long Beach uh, where he'd been before. So uh, that began it. And what, what a great way to begin with Bob Reynolds as your teacher in an environment where everybody loved making music. Oh, yeah, that's great. That's great. So what was the very first conference that you attended as a professional? Well, while I was a graduate student at Wisconsin, uh, there was this uh, renegade group out of CBDNA that was called the Wind Ensemble Conference. And what it was is it was a group of conductors who really wanted to learn more about chamber music for winds, things like octets, Mozart, Cromer, uh, Beethoven, uh, Guno. I mean, all the things that we consider standard repertoire now were really not part of the the mainstream of uh, CBDNA um, at that time in the 70s. So there was this group of about 30 people that kind of started meeting on their own just to explore this repertoire. And um, they were all members of CBDNA, but yet they had this additional conference that they put together and Bob hosted one at Wisconsin. And uh, among the people there were Fred Fennell and Don Hunsberger and Frank Battisti and others who, who really loved the profession deeply, but wanted to learn more about this repertoire. So that was my first conference. And I thought, this is great. And then I was asked by, uh, by Bob to, uh, along with Stan, uh, to put together a wind ensemble repertoire list. And we went nuts. And we ended up with something that was like a book. It was probably mm -hmm. about two inches thick, and it probably had 2,000 works in it, many that I that no one has ever heard about again, but we put it on there because we saw it. Mm -hmm. And that became an important document later on. Uh, uh, when Eugene spent some time at Wisconsin, he then updated that and published it. So, um, uh, but that got me once again, more deeply involved with the repertoire and the, and this, this other than full band instrumentation. Um, mm -hmm. So that conference had a real impact on me. And then I guess my first real CBDNA conference was, uh, uh, maybe in 75 or 77. I think I did the one in Berkeley and then the one in uh, Maryland. You were also involved with the first conference that ultimately became WASB in 1981 while you were at Colorado. Could you tell us more about that one? Yeah, you know, I, I, I got excited about doing things that were um, evolving, that were creating new opportunities, that were celebrating uh, new kinds of... I just got involved with that kind of gestalt. And so when Frank Battisti, uh, along with CBDNA and with Tim Rainish at the Royal Northern College of Music in Manchester, England, uh, came up with this idea of having an international conference, um, he uh, let people know that there were opportunities to perform. And I thought, what a great opportunity that would be for my students to go to Europe and to be able to play there and, and do that. So even though we had no money, no budget, uh, we applied and were accepted and found a way to get there and uh, played at this first conference. It wasn't called WASB then. It was called something like the first international conference of uh, symphonic bands, uh, wind ensembles, composers, conductors, publishers. It was like an all-inclusive y'all come title. Mm -hmm. And uh uh, but uh, but that was a great experience for me and a great experience for our students. At that time, that conference was was very, very wonderful because it celebrated people and it celebrated the opportunity to be collaborative. My students took chamber music with them and had the time and the opportunity and the space to get together with students from other ensembles that were in attendance mm -hmm. and play chamber music together, even if they couldn't speak the mm -hmm. same language, to be able to sit down and do that. And I believe that really enriched their lives. And I love the experience that that provided for them. So it was, that was an exciting time. Yes, for them to go and play you know, chamber music with people and make those connections, that just sounds amazing. One thing you also mentioned, I think kind of resonates with people, you know, you have you have a dream to take somebody, a group to a conference, but you know, you mentioned you had no budget, no, <laughs> you know, how did you convince, you know, your administration to support that that effort, especially, you know, a first time um conference? <laughs> Yeah, well, I've always felt that if you really want to do something, you have to be relentless in pursuit of it. 
Mm -hmm. And uh, I had a, a discretionary budget at the University of Colorado of $500. That was my total discretionary budget. That wasn't going to cover it. Um, but I knew I really wanted to go. And I talked to the ensemble about it. And uh, I got an idea of what it was going to cost. I talked to the airlines. I found out what it would cost for lodging. And, and I, I did the homework on that. And then I figured out what it would cost per student to do that. And I went into the ensemble and I said, OK, I want to do this. I think it'd be a great experience for us. Um, but here's how much it costs. And I need to know, in a worst case scenario, how much of this would you be able to, to afford if, if, if we were going to do this? And if it's nothing, that's OK. Or if it's all of it, that's OK. Just write down what you think you mm -hmm. could do. And some students didn't have anything and couldn't do it. Right. Others mm -hmm. said, no problem. You know, I can cover that. So what mm -hmm. I did is I added that up. And I knew what the total amount was. And I and I knew that the difference between what I had uh, from them and what I needed was X amount. So I went to the dean and uh, and he said, I don't have any discretionary money either. And I said, well, it'd be okay if I talk to other people on campus. So he said, sure. So I went to the provost and I said, I have everything I need for this, but $5,000. And it would be a great thing for the university and a great thing. And mm -hmm. he said, well, okay. Yeah, I'll be glad to put $5,000. So mm -hmm. I thought, well, that works. So then I went to the chancellor and I said, I have everything I need for this, but $5,000. And he said, okay, I can put $5,000 in. And then I went to the president of the university and I said, I've got everything I need, but $5,000. <laughs> and he said, well, if you only need $5,000, I can do that. So I got $15,000. None of them knew at that point. I suppose that was a little shady, but I, I didn't, you know. And so in the <laughs> end, yeah. the didn't play hardly anything. And we were right. able to, to make it work, but only because... Uh, I, I was, I guess, courageous enough to be able to go into those offices. I was only in my second year at the university sure. and mm -hmm. untenured, <laughs> but it had to be, it had to happen. Right. Yeah, so, and it did. So coming back to CVDNA, you've led and been a, a, a part of many really important initiatives, um, one of which is the commissioning committee. Uh, so how did that come about and what impact do you think that has had on our profession? For years, uh, CBDNA has always been, as far as I know, uh, for as long back as I can remember, and if you look at conferences, you'll see this, has always been involved with uh, trying to get more repertoire for our, for our profession. And the way that it worked for many years was that there was a, a budget that was set aside from the membership dues that was dedicated to commissioning. And whoever the president was at that time could guide a, an initiative uh, to uh, commission a composer. So it was kind of it went along with the with the title of president to kind of guide that. And and in that there were some some really wonderful commissions. But depending on what the interest was of the president, it varied from time to time. And there was a group of us that 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 was really hopeful that we could kind of stimulate some some different kind of growth. And so um, we went to the board and 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 said that we had an interest in this and and they decided and i'm not sure who exactly decided but the board decided to have a um a committee that they would put together that was the commissioning committee that would make recommendations and uh and it was going to be an elected committee so um uh from from each division so i was elected to represent the uh uh our division and i think uh Tom Duffy was on that committee and David Whitwell was on that committee and Frank Battisti was on that committee. And, and we met then in Chicago to talk about what was the best way to use this sum of money. And we realized that that sum of money really didn't do enough or frequently enough to make it happen. So we decided that if there was a way that we could use this in smaller amounts of money to stimulate consortia commissioning, we get more bang for the buck. And maybe by having kind of a, a recommended list of composers, encourage people to look at these composers who we felt were worthy of, of, of uh, soliciting pieces from. So I went to the board uh, representing that committee and, um, and proposed uh, this consortium commissioning and uh, and it was approved. So that was the time when CBDNA started uh, initiating consortia commissioning and became a partner with at least three B three CBDNA members to uh, to commission works. Uh, and and that really took off. I mean, not only did CBDNA set something in motion that where they use their own funds, but that became a way that other schools and still do uh, could safely commission without committing ten thousand or twenty thousand um, mm -hmm. dollars. You know, the only exception to that is Jerry Junkin, <laughs> who, 
anyway, when he got, uh, 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 well, anyway, Jerry has done things really amazingly with commissions. At any rate, uh, so that was the beginning. Yeah, that's amazing. It's kind of one of those exponential effort um, or, you know, something that has some exponential effect. You know, you have, it generates here and then, you know, we can look at today and, you yeah. know, see that so many, so many groups and conductors were able to commission. And now, I mean, you know, as, as we open our, our, our accounts each day and we get messages from people, we see almost every day somebody stimulating a new consortium commission. I, and I am excited every time I see that yeah. because I know that it has the potential to grow new art in our profession and to stimulate that relationship with composers, living composers, that I think is such an important part of what we do. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. And so, like I mentioned in the introduction, a huge impact that you've had on our professor profession is the CBDNA conducting symposium, you know, which you hosted at the University of Colorado. So I, uh, you know, remembered that my first time attending was, it was, it was early 2000s. I wasn't able to exactly pinpoint exactly which year, but, you know, was there several times. And um, like I mentioned before, many of the people watching this attended that once or twice, or, you know, many times throughout the years. So how did you become the host of that symposium and you know what impact has that had on cbdna and our profession i think others will have to measure the impact but um but i can tell you that uh, uh that i was really excited to have the opportunity to host a conducting symposium at the university of colorado there were others uh when i first went to colorado when i arrived at the university of colorado eugene corporate went to university of northern colorado the same year we were both it was kind of interesting that with the background that we had that we would be in the same state at the same time mm -hmm. uh and he began a uh a summer conducting symposium up there predominantly for the music teachers in uh colorado and um uh and so when i first got there i i went up and saw what he was doing up there. And I knew that I wanted to host one, but I was trying to decide what its identity needed to be. And um, and then um, a few years later, uh, he left uh, and uh, and there was a need to do that, but I was, I was still thinking about what was the best way. So I wanted to have something that would give professionals a chance to, um, um, to grow and to learn in a safe environment at the collegiate level. So what I did is I spoke with my friends. There's always been a, a, a great group of friends that I've used as advisors, and that included oh, Bob Reynolds and Craig Kirchhoff and Tom Lee and Dick Floyd. I mean, these are people who, if I had an idea, I always ran it by them. And uh, um, and I, I really wanted to host a, um, a symposium that would be dedicated to collegiate conductors, that would help explore repertoire that might be their repertoire, that would explore, explore resources. And so I, I put this together and uh, and found that there was interest for it. And when I found that there was interest for it, I then went to the CBDNA board and said, look, I'd like for this to be the CBDNA conducting symposium. And I will make sure that I only accept people into the symposium who are members of CBDNA. If you'll help support this uh, and let me use the title of that um, with it. So, um, so that became a relationship that went on for over 25 years where we hosted the CBDNA conducting symposium. And we had uh, people who were late in their career, earlier in their career, uh, all coming. Um, we had one person, I remember Stan Hedinger uh, uh, from New Hampshire coming out uh, and he was in his um, late 50s, 60s at the time. And he just said, I needed this so badly. I wish that it had been here earlier. He was just so generous. Um, but typically half the people that would come already had their earned doctorates. They were not there to get college credit. They were not there to try to get the next job, although sometimes they wanted to form uh, uh, relationships, but, but it was really a, a gathering. And so I tried to find a way to serve that. And so we brought in composers and I brought in, uh, at that time, Jim Cochran had a um, music store in St. Louis called Schattinger Music, which was which had one of the best collections of wind repertoire of any place. And so he would drive out with us boatload of music and we would set up a resource center along with the music that we had in our score library. Then I brought out Charles Olson who made batons. I just wanted this to be an unusual opportunity to just explore um, uh, the profession. We would we would have 22 conductors, collegiate conductors uh, that would come out each year. We would typically fill it within five days. All we did was send out a mailing to CBDNA. Uh, there was never anything publicized anywhere else. And at one point, um, I was asked to 
uh, to uh, count how many people were had been involved. And at that time, I counted over 230 active collegiate conductors who had attended the symposium. Wow, that's amazing. It was amazing. And I learned so much. I would bring in other people and we would team teach. And so I brought in great teachers of conducting and my students would play in the ensemble. They volunteered to play because it was just mm -hmm. such an enriching experience. And uh, uh, and it was just it was just such a great time. And then we'd have a party at the end. We'd go up and we'd sit on a mountain and talk about life. I mean, it was just such a spiritual experience. I love it and I still miss it. And, yes. <laughs> uh, but it was, it was it was great for me and for our students and for hopefully for those who attended. Yes. And it's so fun to talk about it because even just little memories, um, you know, I loved I loved attending um, attending it. I think I attended when I was a high school band director the first time. I think, you know, right. You must have been an observer. <laughs> um, well, I don't know. I joined or maybe my recollection is wrong. It was right at that time. You could have joined um, CBDNA if you were a member. I probably, <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, I was, um, and so I just remember how welcoming the, the hosts were how welcoming you were, how welcoming your students were. And that really made, you know, me want to be part of more things at the University of Colorado with my experience, um, you know, attending. And I remember the resource center and the old recital hall, you know, it's fun things when we, when we, you mentioned little bits, little bits that I haven't thought about, you know, for a long time. Okay. Um, and then all the people, of course, the relationships that are formed at conducting workshops and conducting some symposiums, um, especially the CBDNA symposium, which focused on members of CBDNA, you know, yes. to get network with each other. And and I kept the evenings open and people could use a resource center or they could just spend time together. And, and uh, many times they would just all play, be in the dorms and people would get <laughs> together. And I heard of score study sessions. I mean, people would say, well, well, you know, we're, we're, what about this? The, you know, we're doing the Stravinsky octet. What, what's going on here in this theme and variations? And, and so all of this energy was, it was like graduate seminars all over campus, uh, getting together and talking about repertoire and, and supporting each other. And, and it was just so positive. And it was, and I think people left feeling, hopeful and feeling the optimistic and feeling uh, a greater commitment to their art. And that's yes. exactly what I wanted to have happen. Yes. And then they went back to their schools. So again, that exponential effort of something of initiative from CBDNA, which has impact beyond just the event. Yeah. And I was grateful to CBDNA. I mean, over the years, many of those people who attended went back home and started their own symposia. And there yeah. came a time I know where CBDNA questioned, well, why are we still supporting this one in Boulder when they have them all over now and we really don't need to have a dedicated one? And I think uh, they were great. They were grateful for the time that I put in doing that. And they were uh, generous by letting me finish my career by still hosting the CBDNA conducting symposium. And then they pulled the plug, not because of, of uh, Don coming in, Don's done a great job, but because they, they just wanted to finish that with me. And I was, and I had a great time with that. I just had a wonderful time with that. Well, another um, important um, initiative from CBDNA was the uh, beginning of the diversity um, committee that you helped start. So what was the impetus for that to begin? And, you know, can you tell us more about that? People might be surprised that for decades, groups of us would get together and talk about the fact that our profession didn't look like our ensembles. Mm -hmm. That uh, when we looked at the diversity within our ensembles, both in terms of uh, gender and ethnicity, that uh, it wasn't the same that we saw at our conventions and conferences among its members. And we thought that was a problem. And the question was, what can we do to change that? And why is it, first of all, why is it that that's happening? Are we creating a, a hostile environment or are we creating something that doesn't welcome people or, or what is going on? So there was a, uh, when I first became vice president of CBDNA, I think it was 93, um, Craig Kirchhoff was president, Jim Croft was um, vice president or president elect and I was vice president. And then Dick Floyd, uh, the four of us met uh, just to talk about a, uh, a long-term philosophy for what we wanted to do as leaders of CBDNA. Rather than just thinking of a two-year presidency, we were thinking of what impact could we have for long-term goals for the organization? And one of the things that we all felt strongly about was the fact that we need to find a way to get um, more diversity uh, in our profession. And how can we do that? And so um, I told them that I'd be willing to start a committee and I went out and, and made phone calls to people who I felt would be um, 
would be valuable assets uh, because there were people in the profession who did represent different gender, uh, uh, well, who were women and minorities. And, and in that, um, we got together as a committee and, and I'm not sure we came up with a, with a reason why it hadn't happened, but we came up with a way to try to make a change. And that way was to, first of all, let's encourage people to do that. And then let's, within our graduate programs, our doctoral programs and our master's programs, really try to get people into those programs who we think would be great members of the profession and then encourage them and help them get the jobs. And um, uh, and for some people that was not a change, but for others, I think it was. So we really went after that. Then for the conferences that we were having, we really made an effort to try to include opportunities for people to, um, to share uh, uh, their points of view and, and their, um, uh, and their expertise uh, with the whole profession. We put together uh, at the conference that I hosted and Jerry Junkin hosted at the University of Texas, we actually had a, a group of people from outside the profession just talk about diversity. This was in like 99. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. for a long time, we've been working on it. And I think that all that committee did was it just started putting a face to the, to the need uh, and, a, and a place where, where we could get together and start talking about the future. Um, I think there is there there is still a need for that. I don't think that we've we by any means um, um, slayed the dragon. Uh, I think that for whatever reason, there is either not a desire to go in or there's not a welcoming because I still look at the board of CBDNA and and at the national level, I'm still waiting um, to see more diversity within that. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Well, that's so interesting to hear how that that got started and. Um, and there's, yeah, there's still more work to be done. And, um, it's a committee that's still going after, you know, those, that time. So in addition to these committees and the conducting symposium, you also hosted two CBDNA conferences in 1985 and 1995. Um, you know, so one of the things that I think we've talked about over the years is, you know, you like to find ways for people to come together, you know, and how it, and especially come together in our profession. So what were those some things happening in CBDNA at that time? And what were, you know, the priorities then? The priorities that, that I think were, uh, were evident through the conventions that I hosted was a commitment to, um, to new repertoire, mm -hmm. uh, commissioning. Um, uh, and that had not always been the, the case. You know, there, I, I remember one of the first CBDNA conferences that I attended in Maryland, uh, and hearing the the world premiere of and the mountains rising nowhere with the Eastman Wind Ensemble conducted by Hunsberger, and also uh, of the um, uh, dance sequences of Ernst Krennic uh, conducted by Dick Floyd with the Baylor University Wind Ensemble, and those were exciting times. And I remember Bob talking, Bob Reynolds talking to me about um, emblems and about the Dahl Symphony. Those are memories that you have when you're when you're there for the birth of a new piece. And so uh, there was a real commitment, and I think there has been a commitment to, to, um, to new repertoire, but at the same time, there needed to be a commitment to the great artful music of the past. And so that first conference uh, in 85, we actually were able to bring the Netherlands Wind Ensemble out, mm. and um, uh, which had the definitive recordings at that time of Mozart and of Beethoven, and, uh, and we wanted them to come out and share that artistry live and to do open rehearsals uh, where they, because they did that without conductor. Um, uh, and uh, uh, it was just an exciting opportunity just to see how they went about making music. Uh, because that was what it had to be about is how are we going to make music and what kind of music we're we going to make and what are our priorities with the, within the, the conference we also dealt with diversity uh, uh i started the um uh, small college um uh ensemble we we well, we, we, what we tried to do was was to incorporate more and more small college conductors in the national conference and not have it just be about the big schools playing the repertoire that only the big schools could play. And so there needed to be an opportunity uh, to explore other great repertoire that was for um, uh, less experienced players or players that were still evolving or just reduced instrumentation. So um, we started, I, think, I don't know whether we call it Chosen Gems or something like that, but we we started this, this um, uh, addition to the conference where uh, conductors from smaller colleges could come and 
conduct and and have a chance to present these pieces that were really wonderful pieces for uh, that were not as difficult to play, maybe a grade three or grade four piece, but still great music. And uh, and so we tried to provide that opportunity and a celebration of that repertoire and a celebration of those people, even while we had the Netherlands Wind Ensemble there and even while we we're commissioning these great pieces by these great composers, because as you said, the feeling that I always had is I want everyone to feel that there's a place for them in our in our conference, in our in our organization, and in our lives. And there is no one without value. Your value is not measured by the how many good oboe players you have. I mean, it's it has to be more than that. So I've always felt that CBDNA needed to be inclusive of athletic bands, inclusive of small colleges, inclusive of universities of all time, inclusive of all people, and that conferences should be that time that celebrates that unity. Yeah. And so when we think of CBDNA now, uh, what are your thoughts about the work that's going on now by CBDNA? It's unbelievable. The challenges, <laughs> oh my God. Um, who would have thought that there'd ever be a COVID experience where, where a board would have to deal with, with not being able to get together and having, you know, trying to, trying to be president of an organization that can't meet, trying to be president of an organization that deals with music that can't make music. I mean, the mm -hmm. challenges uh, during COVID, I, I have so much respect for what the board did and the leadership of Mark and Glenn Adsit and, and um, uh, Mike Vogt. I mean, the, the, the work that, that, that they've had to do was unlike what any other president has ever had to do before, Tom Verrier. Um, I mean, those guys worked so hard and have worked so hard. And I have so much respect and admiration and gratitude for what they've done. Um, I also believe that these people are people who, 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 um, who are uh, the heirs apparent of, of the best things that I've loved about CBDNA. They're the ones who want to move the profession forward. They're the ones who want to see opportunities for, for growth and for what's next and for embracing um, uh, all the things that might make us deeper artists and better musicians. I think they have a commitment to that. And um, uh, I know that Glenn Adsit now does. I know that uh, Mark does. I know that Mike Boda does. I know that Tom Berrier does. He was a student of mine. Um, and, uh, and I think that there's a momentum now that, that could have been derailed uh, during COVID that was instead rededicated. There was a renaissance of CBDNA that occurred because of that. And, mm -hmm. I, and I'm so grateful to them. So I, I think the world of what they're doing right now. Yeah, yeah, it's great. Yeah, great. The one and, thing that the one thing that I would, and and this is this is just, I would love to see us have more and more ways to come together. We mm -hmm. like in life, we're finding more and more ways to celebrate how we're different, and so and so it's, there's a great celebration going on about what marching men do in 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 the college field, and and they meet and they they have great ideas and they bring in people that that benefit them, and there's there are great things going on in terms of of small colleges. And there are great things going on in terms of uh, groups of, of women and minorities. But what I'm always looking for is how are we uniting all these people? What are we doing to stimulate coming together? And that's what I would encourage our board to do now. And that's what I always feel is the most valuable thing about us is we are inclusive of everyone and everything that's done as part of our career. Well said. And so, um... One of the things that I, kind of a, a common theme, I would say, as we're talking is, you know, we're talking about people and what all of these these committees make a difference for people in our profession and how these conferences and the um, the symposiums, they've brought people together. So, you know, when we think about relationships, what are some relationships that have been, you know, that are encouraged and fostered by CBDNA? And what are some relationships that our profession sometimes makes difficult? Let's start with the first one. <laughs> <laughs> um, for me, the relationships um, that have been developed through CBDNA uh, have included the best friendships I've ever had in my life. Mm -hmm. um, uh, right up here, I have a picture that I'm looking at of uh, Dick Floyd, Tom Lee, Craig Hirkoff, Bob Reynolds, and I at my home in, in Boulder. Uh, this group of guys and I um, have gotten together at uh, in Chicago before Midwest for over 30 years, uh, just getting a, a, a suite and hanging out together and talking about life and talking about the profession. And that friendship would not have happened without CBDNA. 
Um, I would have known Bob, but everybody else that, that, that was in that was because of CBDNA and people who I've been in the wedding party for. And I mean, the, the deepest friendships many times are shared with those people who, who share your beliefs. And uh, and for artists, people who sh who share your imagination and your and your journey, and uh, and so the friendships that I've made with uh, uh, with those people and with other conductors have been great friendships. Friendships with composers, people who have become great friends because we've shared the beginning of something that mattered so much to them. Um, my, my work, uh, I developed unlikely friendships with people like Michael Colgrass and George Crumb because of my collaborations with them. People who I might never had an opportunity to just deal with on the street. I didn't study composition with them, but because I was trying to bring their music to life and in, and being so vulnerable doing it and them being so vulnerable with me that we were able to connect at the basic level of human experience and know that we shared the same ideals. And in that, when you, when you feel that you share something, there's a bond, there's a kindred spirit that that is, uh, is ignited uh, through that shared human experience. And uh, Frank Tichelli has been that way with me, uh, Carter Pan, Dan Kellogg, so many people in my life that have been, become great friendships and relationships. My students, Karen, you, mm -hmm. uh, these people who I consider my family, and I really feel that way. And and you know, it being in Colorado, that that there was an effort to build a family there, and mm -hmm. that everybody everybody shared everything. And uh, every student I've ever had is part of my family, and I would do anything for them at any time. Mm -hmm. Those are relationships that are meaningful. The relationships with your ensemble, those are relationships that 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 are great. The dilemma is that each one of those relationships requires you to be present at some time. Mm -hmm. And the dilemma that creates is for the relationships that are the relationships that aren't part of your career, mm -hmm. your wife, children, mm -hmm. family. Mm -hmm. Those are the relationships that, that have to give up time for you to have the time to spend with all these great friends and composers and everyone else. And so for me, the most difficult relationships in my life have not been with colleagues. It's been finding, uh, I guess, a, a partner that that could that could um, um, be comfortable with the way that 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 I was, but would, would also welcome what I could give. And 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 I had to learn what I could give, and I had to set my own priorities straight in order to be successful at that. And my wife Judy now is unbelievable. She is a person who who anytime I need to do something just says, go do it. And in, and anytime that we're together says, let's do something together. And and I mean, I'm so grateful that she gives that to me and gives me the opportunity that now that I am no longer full-time, I can give more to her. And so the, the shift has gone from the time, all that time that I gave to my students before I now give to Judy. Mm -hmm. That investment has deepened our relationship. But Karen, you've had a family. I yeah. mean- more yep. than me, you've had to juggle this. How have you dealt with that? Well, sometimes it's difficult. I think um, you mentioned Judy, who I've had the privilege to meet, and she's wonderful. Um, you know, I have a partner, Micah, who is my husband, who is uh, just always been really supportive, um, likes, you know, what, enjoys music as a amateur, you know, so he understands. Um, and I think um, is invested is is busy with his own career so he's um he's also busy so i think that matches pretty well and uh we're just good at helping each other out when we need to be help when the other needs help and assistance you know because i think with what we do it um people use the word balance a lot but when we're in flow i don't know that we always we're not in, we're not in balance when we're in flow, when we're really involved, we're really engaged. And so there's, there's this ebb and flow that requires patience of other, of people in our personal lives to kind of go with that ebb and flow sometimes mm -hmm. when we're really excited about something, you know, professionally and, um, you know, but it's not always easy. I like to think about, <laughs> it's kind of funny. Sometimes I think there's times in our lives where we look back and we think, wow, we were really kind of out of, out of balance. And, you know, for me, that was the year 2017. And I said, never again, <laughs> just so many things happening. So many, I was doing so much and I had to kind of put some boundaries there um, because, you know, I just felt like I wasn't giving my kids enough time. Um, and so 
I think probably that that line is different for everybody. And so I know kind of that's where I felt that line and adjusted a little bit. But I mean, I, it's I think for everybody, it's probably such a puzzle and so different, you know, it's so personal. I, I there's something I've learned though, and 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 I don't know that I've ever shared this with you, is that I learned more and more that everything that I did in my life and every relationship I had contribute to what I am as an artist. Mm -hmm. The love that I have for my wife and the and the experiences that we share enrich my uh, relationship with my art because mm -hmm. art is inspired by human experience and it's inspired by love and it's inspired by by conflict it's inspired by all, all the things that we experience in life some composer has used as inspiration i remember warren mm -hmm. benson saying one time that he felt that our repertoire would not be distinguished until every human experience was represented through uh through its repertoire and mm -hmm. um and and i think that that music at its best is um uh, uh amplifies our human experiences and expresses them and in instrumental music expresses them in a nonverbal way so that each person can bring their mirror and experience the music through their own life's experiences but i believe that your experience with your children uh makes you uh, uh, an artist who's deeper in some respects than i am because judy and i never had children so you you can bring that um, mm -hmm. and, and I think all of our life's experiences make us unique, make us different than anyone else, but it's, it's, it's those things that, that, that have changed us and make our lives rich that make us also deeper artists. Yes. And we never know the impact of these things. It's, you know, when we think about children, we think, well, how can we get things done? You know, how can, because we're so busy as individuals and how can we add somebody else to our life? But there's room, you know, there's room and, things change and get better at maximizing time and all of those, all of those, all of those things. It's when, when I was uh, uh, one of the symposia that I, that I hosted, and it may have been the, the last one, it's uh, uh, the CBDNA symposium. We actually had a panel discussion talking about uh, the profession and relationships and, mm -hmm. and how it impacted us. And somebody asked, um, uh, you know, about, uh, um, you know, what, how does your wife feel about your um, uh, the the time that you give to your career? Obviously, they'd had uh, that was a question they had to deal with. So I think this is something that that everyone mm -hmm. who gives so much to the profession and knows how how the the profession will keep asking more from us because there's so many places to go. We don't have time to learn every piece. We don't have time to 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 uh, listen to every performance. We don't have time to do all the things that, that we'd love to do. And so we're constantly making priority decisions about how we spend our time and, and, yes. and what we do. And included in that priority decision for me has always been I needed to have time for reflection. So solitude was also something I was trying to find a, a way to build in as well. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, sitting in a room reflecting upon the day and, and asking myself, um, you know, how I did, or or what, what I might need to do next. Um, yes. but, I, but I but I'm really glad. Thank you for sharing that, uh, Karen. I, I think that that I think that's something that anybody watching this probably is thinking about their own life and their own relationships, because that's something that will always be in in conflict to the most um, ambitious careers. Mm -hmm. And one, um, what, what this brings up, you know, something that you gave me a card once that says, <laughs> that says leap in the net will appear. Um, it's so useful when thinking about a lot of things, but one of which is, is balance. Because one way that I think about that is, you know, you do your preparation, like you have a certain amount of time and then you have to trust that you've done it. And so you leap. And you hope the net will appear. You know, you've done it. You trust yourself. And it's one, um, uh, it's it's one, I think, helpful, helpful thing to think about, you know. But I I I still think about that. That card was such an impactful card. Yeah, it just as yeah. back down to that, if I if you don't mind me sharing this, uh, I was on a gig and I was in the San Francisco airport and I've been working with Karen, and Karen and I have been working and she uh, I mean, Karen came in so prepared and, and aced her entrance exams and was uh, so diligent with everything and so prepared and so wonderful. And we were working on just being more whatever, uh, mm -hmm. get, get, filling, filling the willingness and the vulnerability to give it all. And um, and I came across this card in a shop and, it, and I saw it said leap in the net will appear. And I thought, that's it. So uh, I thought of you immediately. 
uh, and and uh, and I came back and I gave that to you. And yeah. I'm so glad that that was meaningful because I wanted it to to let you know that I saw that in you and you just needed to let go. <laughs> it's such a good lesson. I mean, it's, 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 it's so true. And the thing I would, the thing I always say to my ensembles is for running, go with what you've got. We're going to do our run, go with everything you've got. And wow, was that impactful? I mean, the whole, it's, um, it's just such a great life lesson. Well, you're terrific. You learn lessons really well. <laughs> <laughs> <Thank you. laughs> um, so, you know, just from knowing you for so many years, I know that asking questions is something that you really think is important. And I've learned so much by how you think about questions. So what questions should people in the profession be asking themselves and others? Yeah, I, I've always felt that that, uh, that that if you knew what questions to ask, you could keep your journey going. That answers kind of many times uh, kept people in place, and and so I've always questioned everything. I've always questioned my own point of view on a piece of music. Every time I've come to a a new piece, I feel that I need to ask myself, how have I changed, and how can that influence this piece of music? Mm -hmm. So, how have I changed is always an interesting question to ask because uh, maybe I've changed in ways that have. Um, made me a better musician, a better artist, a better person, or maybe I've changed in some ways that, that I don't want to change, which I, I need to redirect. Uh, but I think that there's a lot of questions you have to ask yourself. Uh, when I'm in a rehearsal, um, um, I'm, I think the question I'm always asking myself, not only because I hear everything that I want to change. I mean, I studied a score. We all go into rehearsal you know, the the sound that comes at us is an approximation of what's on the score and we're we're hoping to make it that. But it's so easy to listen for what's wrong. And I and I'm always interested in building relationships. And so I think one of the questions that that is really good to ask yourself in a rehearsal and that I ask myself is what's going right? And who can I um draw attention to in the rehearsal who I want to use as a model for other people? Who who has spent the time practicing who needs to be celebrated? Who in here is with me on everything that we're doing? Who's doing it right? Because it's so easy to focus all your attention on what's wrong and on who's doing it wrong. And so I, I wanted to create an atmosphere uh, where, where we do that. So that question, I think, is a really important question. I think asking questions of your score is really important. I think uh, you look at a bass drum and you say, okay, it's a bass drum. But I always ask, well, why? <laughs> <laughs> because it's working with composers, they made a decision. Well, why did they make that decision? Mm -hmm. Why is that bass drum there in the 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 third movement of the whole first suite? What what is that about? I mean, is that just a a punctuation mark, or is it a cannon shot, or and how is that? And if I decide one way or the other, how does that influence the tempo of the piece, or how does that influence? So I'm always asking, why is this entrance coming here? Why is this piano? Why I I just question things. And score study for me is just asking a lot of questions. Mm -hmm. I think when you're, when you're with people who you respect, asking questions uh, rather than trying to tell them what you've done, uh, mm -hmm. asking, asking them questions. There's so much to be learned from the people around you, the, the artists, the faculty members, the, uh, the students. Um, I always liked arriving to rehearsals early and asking students who were there warming up early, how's it going? What's new? Uh, what are you working on? Um, investing in them by asking questions. I think so much of the connections that we have in the world are destroyed by only giving answers and never asking questions. So I think that, that all of us as artists need to ask ourselves at the end of each day, was I the best I could be that day? And if not, how could I be better? Yes. Yes. I just have, again, learned so much about how you, th how you think about questions. One impact, one real simple kind of rehearsal technique question that, that you shared with, with your students that I just always used was um, just a simple question. You know, if, if a part isn't prepared and, and saying, <laughs> when, when, when do you think you can have that down? Yeah. And they would say, well, we can have it done in a week. And then I'd write it down. We'd all write it down. And it was, I mean, such a tip rather than saying, we need you to have this done by next Wednesday. I mean, sometimes we need to do that, but the, the, the posing it as a question, just it helps well, people more um, impetus for their own um, internal desire or um, intrinsic motivation, I guess. Yeah. I, I always felt, um, I always felt that a, that a rehearsal was where people um, came to learn everybody else's part. Yeah. 
And um, and you can't learn everybody else's part if they haven't learned their part. So and I, I shared that in the syllabus with the ensemble each year. And then if somebody wasn't prepared, I had to make an assumption. I could say they weren't prepared and have it be a negative or I could say they haven't had time to mm -hmm. learn. This. So the question is. Uh, it's obvious that you haven't had time to do this because you're a better player than you played that right now. So when can you have this ready? And mm -hmm. almost always at Colorado, the students would say next rehearsal. Yeah. <laughs> and then I would make a point of hearing that and I would make a point of saying thank you. Yeah. And I wanted that to be the culture of that rehearsal. Mm -hmm. People knew that I knew, but I also respected their ability to do it and that I didn't take everybody's time to teach somebody their part. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I'm glad you remember that, Karen. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so have there been any any things that we haven't talked about um, that, that you'd like to mention about CBDNA um, that I haven't asked you? I think that I think that CBDNA for me is a um, uh, is is a an organization that first and foremost should be about um the human spirit and uh and maybe i feel that way about music in general but i think that we that that it, it it's it's so important that we that we make sure that we keep our focus in the right place and and that we encourage that of our colleagues as well that that the goal is not to be impressive it's to be expressive um that the that the goal is not what we can get but what we can give that that we're constantly trying to invest in in a future that's that's deeper and richer artistically. And I think as long as we do that, as long as we are willing to be vulnerable in that way and provide leadership that way and accept the the fact that not everybody feels that way and that it's okay for people to feel another way, but it's not going to deter us from that that pathway, I think our organization will continue to lead. And I think for me, this organization has led us in so many ways. It's led us in the evolution of our repertoire. It's led us in, in um, uh, commissioning. It's, it's led us in the celebration of great uh, works for, uh, for diverse uh, uh, ensembles. It's led us in relationships with composers. It's led us in, um, uh, in so many, many ways. And I, and I think it has the potential to continue doing that as long as we put people first. As long as we put people first, that's a great, <laughs> I think that's a great way to close. Well, um, Karen, it's great to see you, by the way. <laughs> great to see you as well. I look um, at you and I'm reminded of so many wonderful things that you've done and so many great, <laughs> I remember the Nadia Boulanger work that you did as part of your dissertation <laughs> and how much I learned about Nadia Boulanger from the work that you did on that. I just, I, I have great memories of, of all of our time together and this was another one. So thank you. Well, thank you. And I, me as well. Um, thank you for all you've done, you know, for me. And um, it's just always such a joy to see you and reconnect. And I'm really grateful for, to have had this opportunity to interview you for this project. Well, this has been a, a, a wonderful opportunity and I'm, I'm humbled that, that we're doing this, <laughs> yes. but thank you, Karen. You're welcome. Thank you.